this is the Meridian Hotel. We were across the street from the pyramid. So as soon as you got there, you're like, whoa, look at that. There's the pyramid. And we, were, we had this great conference center and we would all meet and sit around these tables and different people would speak. So this was kind of our home base uh, gathering in the first night. Um, Nassim busted out the crystals. We had never seen them before. We saw how you could like snap them together with magnets and make these 64 tetrahedron crystals out of them. And then we'd hold them and like ch check them out. And uh, it, was, it was awesome to watch everybody, you know, interact with these for the first time. Here's 192 crystals, uh, three sets of 64. These are the three sets that we brought into the pyramids uh, a few days later. And then we went out onto the Giza Plateau right away because our, our guides were smart enough to know that you don't just sit in the hotel on the first day, that everybody wants to get right out to the plateau. And so here are some of those stones that Adam showed a picture of with this crazy level of erosion outside of it. And Muhammad uh, reminded us, our, our main, one of our main guides, that these stones were encased by granite on the outside and granite on the inside. And so they were removed, maybe, or they eroded. It's more likely they got removed to be used for other things. So they were, they were like protected for a really long time. Then the granite got taken off. Then it eroded this much. And they think it could be as old. Robert Schock says that could be 80,000 years old. Okay, so if you start talking 80,000 years old to an Egyptologist, they'll go crazy. They're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Yeah. This was built by Khufu and Khufu's son. This is like 5,500 years ago. Don't start even telling me 10,000 years ago. And certainly don't start telling me anything like tens of thousands of years ago. They'll go insane. And so all I can tell you is read, read uh, Graham Hancock's latest book, Magicians of the Gods, and, and learn about the cataclysms that happened on this planet 12,400 to 12,800 years ago, multiple cataclysms that caused the Great Flood. And then you'll see how this might be possible. Here's a very happy Nassim finally getting to the Giza Plateau. Um, it was great to like be there with Nassim, discovering this stuff for the first time with all of us. We did a great group photo up at the um, viewpoint on the first day, and I did a quick you know, iPhone uh, wide shot. We have a, an official group shot that was sent to us by the guides that we'll be posting. Here's another candid from that um, preparing everybody to like stand in the same place at the same time kind of moment. Um, and then when we were leaving, I was standing up on that temple that's by the third pyramid. And I just saw the, like the tribes <laughs> of Egypt walking across. This is everybody from our group going back towards the buses. I just kind of thought that was an iconic view right there. And then, yeah, we had to do the obligatory get onto a camel and, and ride, which the camels are funny and, uh, you don't want to ride for more than a short distance on those things or else you won't be able to walk the next day. And then like Marshall was saying, when we were standing in the middle of the night under the full moon in between the pyramids, this was waiting for a group and I kind of ran off and did a long exposure. Um, it was seriously magical to be out, outside at night because just like a ski area, the, the Giza Plateau closes at four o'clock. You can't be there at night unless you have very special permission. And even then, you're certainly not going into all three pyramids on the same night. So it was a very uh, rare experience to be able to do that. We took this shot of us, you know, waiting for the bus and just the light of being at night. It was, it was, it was awesome out there. Here's a scene of us inside the, one of the buses. We had four buses, you guys. It was, it was a major thing. When we had to go somewhere, it was 170 people. This is the black uh, base stones that are just off to the side of the Great Pyramid. And here's a telltale cut. And you can see that they cut with some sort of blade, right? They made this long striation and then they went down and then backed out. So now you can see the thickness of the blade. You can see that blade is only like a centimeter or less thick. So you had to have some incredibly strong blade if you're cutting, you know, dolerite and granite and these very hard types of stone. Um, this is uh, Abu Sir, I believe, and Nassim is showing us an example in this rock here of a drill hole. Uh, we would stand around and our guides and Nassim would go back and forth talking about what we were looking at. This is standing up on some rocks looking down again and on Abu Sir, and we'd kind of break up into smaller groups so that you know each guide could do a more detailed explanation without having to yell to the whole group. But here's one of the examples of a borehole that we were seeing, and you'll notice these lines 
showing that this was probably made by a device that was spinning very quickly. And then the question is, well, what was holding that device that was spinning quickly? Was it a human being with a hand tool? It doesn't look like it. And so now what? You've got a machine that's spinning something very quickly and cutting holes in granite. The traditional Egyptologist would tell you, oh yeah, these guys had copper tools and they were pulling stones with vine ropes. You've heard the story, right? And we saw evidence that just doesn't add up. I mean, look at that. You can see they went to the end and then they pulled back again. And again, you can see the size of the blade. So it was probably a circle, right? That was cutting this out. It was crazy to see this in real life, you know? And here's the, one of the pyramids at Saqqara, the oldest one, right? It's still under construction. And you can see it's very different than the Great Pyramid. My personal feeling after being there this whole time is that the Great Pyramid is the oldest. And then the Egyptian showed up and said, oh, that thing's really cool. Let's build a city next to that thing. And then let's try to imitate that and build one of our own. And so they tried to do it like this. And that was like their best first attempt at trying to make, you know, later <laughs> pyramids. But it didn't nearly come close to the level of precision. This is in one of the tombs in Saqqara with the stars on the ceiling. Um, it doesn't really give you a feeling for how hot and how humid it was in there. It was literally sauna status in there. It was, it was kind of crazy to be in there and resonate, and everybody was toning. Um, amazing resonance in all these chambers. This is a big uh, well type of hole that was dug, and the Sim was talking about how it's non-trivial to make this big of a, a hole and, and have the sides be all cut perfectly. And then there are these stone uh, cutouts here, and they thought maybe that they were like using that to, uh, you know, make a, a scaffolding. Here's the uh, some of the bowls that we saw carved out at uh, Abu Ghraib. Um, really beautiful uh, cutout bowls. No one's exactly sure what they're for. This is from the top of the ruined pyramid, looking down on that circular pedestal that we saw before. Uh, that we all sat around and did some toning and put our hands together and put a 64 tetrahedron crystal in the middle and there's the moon rising and we got to be there for sunset. That was one of the more iconic moments where we got to just have some time to hang out and, and soak it all in. Um, this is one of my favorite shots from the trip um, with everybody's hands uh, connected and touching right there. That's kind of like, grabs the essence of the trip for me because we really were a unified group wherever we went. We had this sense of everybody's together. We were all wearing the crystals. This is Saqqara, some great uh, you know, columns and the roof I think was replaced. This is us walking towards the Serapium where the giant boxes are. Adam showed some great pictures of that. They of course would want you to ride on camels to go down there because uh, that's one of their great tourist uh, activities. It's, it's pretty fun for a short time, like I said. I don't have a bunch of pictures of the boxes, but I wanted to show you this one picture of Muhammad pointing out that, this is very interesting, that the lid is coming off the edge of the box, and he's pointing to this spot where you can see that there was a liquid that dripped down and then was dripping off the underside of the lid. It's really highly polished and really smooth and black. And then on the other underside of the lid, it's not highly smooth and black, except where this liquid was dripping. So it's evidence that perhaps they were polishing this rock with some sort of liquid substance that would polish the rock. What that liquid is, we don't know, but that's a great mystery um, to point out. It looks like I have a double of this one. So this is uh, the middle pyramid from the temple that's on the top of the causeway going down towards the Sphinx. This is the temple of the Sphinx. Um, these blocks were cut from around the Sphinx enclosure and stacked to really beautiful uh, temple. This is a view of the Sphinx and the second pyramid from the temple of the Sphinx. Uh, I just wanted to throw in a picture here of William uh, presenting. He did an incredible job presenting some of the um, studies that were done with the crystals uh, using wheatgrass. And uh, he also presented about the uh, papers that he's been working on with Nassim and Amira. Here's Amira. She did her very first public presentation to the layman. She's presented at physics conferences before, but she has not presented to you know, delegates or members of the general public. And so it's great to be able to witness her first presentation. She did a great job. This was on the last night um, of the first week of the delegate gathering. We did a big circle 
kind of saying goodbye um, uh, back at the hotel. And then there was an interesting transition where in between trips, the staff went ahead of the rest of the group on an early, early morning flight. And so we had a day to explore in a small group. I think there was only a few delegates and the rest of the us were staff. And so we went to this uh, uh, Habu temple and it was really cool. I just wanted to show you a couple shots of the Habu temple. Um, there was hardly anybody there. <laughs> it was amazing to go to these places with no tourists because like the Great Pyramid, you can't get a clean shot without people in it. If you ever get a chance, this is right near the Colossal of Memni statue. It's just across the road from there. Uh, then we also went to go see this temple called Temple of Seti I. And again, there was absolutely no one there. It was just us, uh, a dozen of us. This is a happy Nassim inside of the uh, temple at Habu. And then we got onto the boat. This is the very beginning of the Nile cruise. The top of the boat was open, and we could sit up there and have. Um, you know, group discussions, and Ms. Sim pulled out the crystals, and this was like going down the Nile at sunset on the first day, and it was fascinating. Everywhere we went down the Nile, any kids that were anywhere near the shore would yell and scream and wave at us, and we spent a lot of time just waving back to all these kids and all these people. They were very happy to see us everywhere we went. Sometimes we had people from both shores, like, waving at us at the same time. And then we went to this temple at Dendera, Again, Marshall showed some great shots of the ceiling. Every single inch of this thing was covered in hieroglyphs. Uh, again, another one of these vertical panoramics. Here's those uh, quote-unquote light bulbs. Again, it was like a sauna in there, super hot, and these uh, tunnels are not very wide. That's as far back away from the, the wall as you can get to take a, a photo. This is climbing up some ladder inside there. Um, somebody took a picture of me standing up in the doorway. Um, the light was coming in and making some, you know, dramatic shadows like Indiana Jones style. Um, this is the outside of the temple at Dendera. There's like this big well um, and a smaller temple in the back. I went in there and took some shots. There's a huge uh, Cleopatra uh, carving on the back of this thing. And then here's an example of another uh, bit of carving that we saw at, uh, this is, I think, in Karnak, um, inside of a room that was uh, one solid piece of alabaster, which is very hard to carve without it breaking. And you can see that they cut a very sharp edge and the blade went in and then they pulled it out. Again, you can see the width of the blade. It's about the same width as all the other cuts we saw. And then here's Nassim standing in front of the 400 ton obelisk. That's one solid piece. It comes from the quarry in Aswan. And he was noting that it's perfectly carved, perfectly straight, perfectly tapered, uh, perfectly balanced, perfectly centered, and perfectly aligned with the cardinal directions on top of a room with a resonating chamber underneath it. And there's another one that's lying down just the top of it. And he was hitting it with his fist and it rings like a tuning fork. So this is a giant resonating device. No wonder he's so happy. Here's a picture of Hugh Newman on the far left doing a really great presentation on the, the parallels between Egypt and Peru. And just seeing, you know, some of the slides that Hugh has of Peru gets you really excited for Peru because we're going to see some stuff that's very similar <coughs> to what we saw in Egypt. Here's a, you know, panoramic of this back of the Sphinx and the enclosure of the Sphinx, which gives you an idea of the uh, level of water erosion on there, and that's Robert Schock's work uh, with John Anthony West, and they were the ones who first proposed that the Sphinx is much, much older than commonly believed, and now we're getting more and more evidence of ancient civilizations um, going farther and farther back, including Gobekli Tempe in Turkey and other sites. This is uh, Leslie standing at the Temple of Habu, um, these walls were like, I don't know, 50 feet tall, covered in hieroglyphs. And then we got to go to Abydos, the Osirin Temple, and we were lucky enough that the water levels, which are usually down at the bottom there, were low enough that we could go down inside there. We weren't sure if we were going to be able to. 100-ton granite boulder that's sitting on top of 200-ton pillars, tongue and groove, you can see that, you know, huge groove shape in there 
Uh, and then you've got the flower of life right underneath there. Uh, and these, these are like 25 feet long, some of these uh, blocks. And we got to go walk around down inside there. Um, and the water level changes, but it might be connected to the Nile, they think, through channels. And there's the famous flower of life. I got down there just in time to catch the last rays of sunlight. And uh, that's the clearest picture I could get. Um, we took a good long time looking at that. And here's those classic hieroglyphs in the temple that's just outside, uh, that's at, up higher at the level of the desert, showing what some people think look like a helicopter and a submarine and an airplane. And the official story is that there were multiple carvings of hieroglyphs laid on top of each other, which made it look like this. No one really knows. This is the temple at Luxor. We got to go there at night. Some really incredible structures in there. This is the temple of Hachisput, and this is uh, near the you know Valley of the Kings. And we got to tour all around there. It's like right up against these cliffs. Uh, there's Victoria taking a picture. Uh, and again, unbelievable to be in these places. And uh, it was very hot though, I'll have to say. Um, it was quite a, an endurance test to see how much sun you could get and then everybody was bummed we had to stop for two minutes, but I got this picture of Hugh Newman taking a picture of the Colossi of Mumnai. These are single pieces of stone, some of the biggest, heaviest statues in the world. And then we also got to go see the unfinished obelisk in Aswan Quarry, single biggest, uh, uh, single biggest piece of stone that we have in the world, except for maybe the stones at Baalbek in Lebanon. And here's what they supposedly carved it with, that piece of dolerite. There's Foster Gamble in the sim. Um, and you can see these scoop marks. And we spent a lot of time looking at those scoop marks and imagining what kind of tool would have done that. And you don't have a lot of space between the obelisk and the wall. So that's a big mystery. This is on Elephantine Island in the middle of the Nile. Uh, notice how incredibly precise these carvings are of this of this block. This is not done with pounding stones. You can see here from this uh, detail. And then we got to cruise down the Nile on these little boats. It was gorgeous. Uh, just seeing like everyday life and farmers and stuff on the Nile and these traditional boats sailing up and down. We stopped at this uh, near a Nubian village and this was the guy's store. I thought it was the best uh, market stall I saw. It was just in the sand on the side of the Nile. And then at the end of the trip on the Nile, we went back to visit the Sphinx and we got to go in between the paws. And this is the group that was on the Nile trip in between the paws. And here's a, like a candid from that same session. Um, that's Muhammad in the center there with his cast on his arm. He was one of the main guides who helped uh, secure all our permissions to go around all these different sites. And here we are happy at the very end with the, the cheer on the final day. And we got to stay there through sunset. It was just gorgeous light everywhere. And then on the final night, we got to stay at the famous and historic Mena House right across the street from the Great Pyramid. Um, if you ever get a chance to go back to Egypt or go for your first time, at least spend one night at this hotel. It's amazing just to walk around the inside of that place. Um, and this was from the top of the uh, one of the hotels on the Nile. We went to the Egyptian Museum when there was no one there. And got to just cruise, every see everything. This is Akhenaten and um, all the treasures that were in Tutankhamun's tomb. And that's the famous disc of Sabu, the mysterious disc that we don't really know what it was for, but it's carved out of rock. And I, I like this shot, it's the third pyramid. Notice the trapezoid shaped stone. It looks like a hammer dulcimer, so I threw that in there. Uh, Great pyramid, the very last day that we were there, we got to catch incredible sunlight and we kind of dawdled and found a guard who was willing to take us to these spots and not kick us out. And uh, Man, he took us to some great spots. And these are the small pyramids. Um, got some panoramics of the big pyramids. And then he took us to these temples that are just off the causeway that, again, you don't normally get to go see. He kept on, like, saying, Shh, hiding us and, and showing us these spots, you know. Uh, there's this air shaft that they cut into the side of the tomb. And then uh, there's a little gecko here hanging out above a, a hieroglyph, um, part of the tombs. Again, you can see that these are cut right into the, into the rock. And then we also got to go do the bent pyramid because we missed it when, we, when you guys originally went. You can see uh, somebody down there in the lower left corner for scale. And this is the, again, the bent pyramid. So Egypt, holy mackerel, unbelievable. That city, uh, Cairo, 
uh, blows minds. And uh, the whole trip was, you know, hard to describe. I hope that the photos did some justice to show you like the diversity of, of where we went.